Welcome to the introduction to chapter 2, Production, Prices and the Distribution of Income. My name is Niels Gottfries and I am the author of the book Macroeconomics. And this is an introduction, about 30 minutes, uh, to chapter 2. And it's meant as an introduction so as to prepare you for more careful studies of the topics in this chapter. So this chapter is about the supply side and there are four main themes in this chapter. One is the production function, another is the price equation, then we come to the long run or what we call the natural level of income and then we look at what determines the real wage and the distribution of income in the economy. And much of this chapter is going to be repetition of microeconomics. But we will still go through these things quite carefully because these uh, things, the production function, the price equation, are really key building blocks of our macroeconomic model. And one of the basic ideas in this textbook is to build the macroeconomic model from the micro foundations. So you see the relation to microeconomic theory and this way also have a more consistent story about the macroeconomy. So let us start with the production function. Well, imagine we have an ice cream store where they produce their own ice cream and we ask the manager what determines how much ice cream you can produce? And um, the manager says, well, that depends on how many ice cream machines my, I have and how many workers I have. And maybe he says that if I have so many machines, so many workers, I can produce this much. Well, if he says like that, he is actually describing his production function. He's saying that there is some relation between the inputs that he has and the output. And this mathematical expression here, it says nothing more than that. It just says that there is some relation between production Y and the capital stock and the number of workers K and N that you use for production. And note that all these Y, K and N are measured in physical units. Production is units of the goods produced. Capital is stock of capital, the number of uh, machines you can think of it. And N is the number of workers, if we assume that everyone works eight hours a day. So it's a, a physical relation. There is no money involved in this. And the production function, of course, reflects the technology. If we have a better technology, we can uh, produce more. And later we will put in a capital letter E to represent the technology. And this production function is key to understanding prices, the income distribution, growth. So it's, it's really important that you familiarize yourself and get to know the production function. And throughout the book we're going to assume that the production function has three characteristics. The first is that production is increasing in K and N. So the more capital we have, the more labor, the more we can produce. The second is that the marginal product of labor is decreasing in labor for a given capital stock. So this says that if we add more workers for a given number of machines, then each additional worker will add less to production. And the intuitive reason why this is reasonable is that if we add more and more workers without adding machines, then in the end the workers will have very little machines to work with. So the additional workers will not add so much to production. And the same with capital, if we add a lot of machines but there are no workers to, to work with the machines, then the additional units of capital will not contribute so much to production. 
And finally, we assume constant returns to scale, and that means that if we double the inputs, we will double the production. Or if we increase inputs by 10%, then production will increase by 10%. So here I have an example of the production function for the ice cream store. We see if we have one machine and one worker, we, we can produce 300 ice cream cones. If we have one machine and two workers, we can produce 500 ice cream cones. With three workers, 570. With four workers, 600. That was with one machine. If we then add another machine, we increase production to 1,000 ice cream cones per day. So let us check if this production function has the characteristics that we assumed. Well, we see that as we increase the number of workers while having one machine, we increase production. So production is increasing in labor. But second, we see that if we look at the marginal product of the workers, we see that as we go from one to two workers, production increases by 200. And as we go from two to three workers, production increases by 70. And as we go from three to four, we, production increases by 30. So we see the marginal product the marginal contribution of each additional worker is declining as we add more workers, keeping the number of machines constant. And that was the second property of the production function. Finally, we can check constant returns to scale if we compare the case of one machine and two workers with two machines and four workers. We double the inputs there and we see that production also doubles from 500 to 1000. So we see that, uh, yes, at least in that case, when we go from 1 and 2 to 2 and 4, we have constant returns to scale. As we know, we don't have to have constant returns to scale. There can be both increasing and decreasing the returns to scale in the real world. But we're going to assume constant returns to scale in our analysis. It's a natural reference point. And the idea behind it is, of course, that if one machine and two workers can produce 500, if we just put another machine and another two workers beside them, they can produce another 500 ice cream cones. OK. So that was the production function. Now we come to the price equation. So let us start with the case of perfect competition. Imagine we have an economy where there's only one good that is produced, which is ice cream. One sort of ice cream. And it is sold for two euros per ice cream cone. And the going wage is 140 euro per worker and day. Yes, and that means that the wage corresponds then to 70 ice cream cones. The real wage of the worker is 140 divided by 2, that is 70 ice cream cones. That's how much he can buy for his wage. And we assume that in this, in this uh, store they only have one ice cream, uh, cream machine. Maybe next year they buy another one, but right now they have one machine. And we neglect other inputs. We assume they have their own cow, they can milk, and they grow their own vanilla in the garden, and so, so there are no other inputs to simplify. So, how many workers should you hire? Well, if we go back to the production function, we know that the real wage is 70 ice cream cones. Well, if we hire the second worker, he will increase production by 200 ice cream cones, and you pay him corresponding to 70 ice cream cones. So clearly, the second worker is worth hiring. The third worker, well, he will 
increase production by 70 ice cream cones but you also have to pay him 70 ice cream cones or the corresponding amount in euros so clearly it doesn't matter if you hire the third worker or not in terms of profits the fourth worker he will add 30 ice cream cones to production and you pay him 70 so clearly it's not worth hiring the fourth worker so you see that clearly it is profitable to hire workers as long as the marginal product is higher than the real wage then we want to hire workers and for the marginal work the m worker who is just worth hiring or not hiring the marginal product is equal to the weight you hire up to that point where the marginal product has fallen down to the level of the real weight so that's a profit maximization condition for the firm you can put this in another way which is just another way of saying the same thing and that is to say you should increase production if the marginal cost is lower than the price and the optimal level of production is where the marginal cost equals the price so in this case for the last worker the wage is 140 and the and the third worker produces 70 ice cream cones that means that the marginal cost is the wage you pay him divided by how much he adds to production that is his marginal product 140 divided by 70 that is 2 so that is your marginal cost and that was the price of ice cream cones so so this worker is just worth hiring so saying that the price is equal to marginal cost is the same thing as saying that the marginal product of labor is equal to the real wage but in this book we are not going to assume perfect competition instead we will assume monopolistic competition and that means that you have a large number of firms but they produce similar but not identical products and a key implication of that is that each firm faces a limited demand for their product so you can't sell anything you want at a given price and you face a downward sloping demand curve so we can write the demand curve for the firm as follows PI equals P of Y I P and Y so PI is the price charged by firm I so if, suppose I is 45 then this is firm 45 and the price they can charge depends on how much they want to sell which is YI and it also depends on the general price level and the general income level in the economy also affects their demand but the point is that to increase their sales and production they have to reduce the price and this is very realistic because this is the situation of almost all firms in the economy there are very few firms that sell their products in a market where there is a price and they can sell any amount they want there are some markets like that where there is an exchange and a given price but that's the exception normally you face a limited demand in the market for a given price and as we will see this will imply that firms set higher prices and produce less compared to the case of perfect competition and to see this clearly we note that the revenue of the firm is how much you produce times the price and now we noted that the price depends on how much we sell so let us ask what is the marginal revenue how much does revenue increase if you sell one more unit well you find that easily by taking the derivative 
with respect to yi inducing the principle for how you take derivative of a product of two functions. So we view this as a product of two functions and we first take the derivative of the first function. The first function is simply yi. Well, the derivative of yi with respect to yi is 1. And then you have that times the price, which is pi i, right? And then you have yi, and then you take the derivative of the price with respect to uh, production, dpi dyi. So here we see the logic of monopolistic competition that if we increase production, uh, there are two effects. The first uh, term shows that, well, we sell one more unit and if, uh, if we just sell one unit, we earn the price on that unit. But, at the same time, we have to lower the price on all the units that we're own, already selling. And that is captured in the second term, that the price falls by dpi dyi and that you have to multiply that price decrease by all the units that you're already selling. So that's a negative effect because dpi dyi is negative and, and that will mean that the marginal revenue is lower than the price. You see that right there. Now you can rewrite this in a convenient form if you put a parenthesis around and you pull out the pi, you can check this derivation by doing the reverse, and then you recognize that dpi over pi over dyi over yi is 1 over the elasticity of demand, the inverse of the elasticity of demand. If we call the elasticity eta, then this says 1 plus 1 over eta times the price where eta is the elasticity of demand and we assume that this is a number that is smaller than minus 1, maybe minus 5 or minus 10 or something. And now we see that the marginal revenue is lower than the price because the thing in parentheses here is going to be a number which is smaller than 1 because eta is negative and bigger than 1. So you have 1 minus uh, something that is smaller than 1. So the whole parenthesis is smaller than 1, saying that the marginal revenue is lower than the price because you have to reduce the price in order to sell more. So this now gives us the price equation. We just note that you want to increase production and reduce the price to the point where the marginal revenue is equal to the marginal cost. If marginal revenue is higher than the marginal cost, you want to increase production. If it's lower, you want to reduce production. But the profit maximizing level of production and price is where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. We then use our expression for the marginal revenue and we solve for the price and we find that the price is determined by 1 plus a markup times the marginal cost and where the markup is denoted mu and you see that mu is determined by this expression that 1 plus mu equals 1 over 1 plus 1 over eta and that is a number bigger than 1 and you can note here that this markup that the firm charges over the marginal cost depends on the price elasticity. So the higher the price elasticity in absolute value, the lower is the markup. You see that in the expression if eta is minus infinity, then mu is going to be zero. That is, the price is equal to marginal cost as we noted before under perfect competition. So, now we have our price equation saying that the price is 1 plus a markup times the marginal cost. And we also note that the markup is determined by the degree of competition. So that 
if we have tight competition, many firms producing similar products, then the elasticity will be high and the markup will be low. And of course the marginal cost is equal to the weight divided by the marginal product, so we can also write the price as 1 plus mu times w over the marginal product. And we will use this price equation throughout the course, so it's very important that you understand how to derive it and understand the intuition behind it. Now a very popular production function is the Cobb-Douglas production function. And it's written like this, you have y production equals capital stock raised to coefficient alpha and uh, then we have added here now a technology factor that we call E and we raise that to 1 minus alpha you can read more about that in the book and then we have the input of labor, the number of workers raised to 1 minus alpha and alpha you can think of that as it's a coefficient that has to do with the technology and te it has to do with how important capital is in production. A high alpha means that capital is an important factor in production. And if we have that production function we can easily calculate the marginal product of labor by just taking the derivative with respect to n and that is the marginal product of labor. We substitute that into the price equation and then we get an expression that shows how the price level is determined and it gives quite intuitive results that the price level depends on the wages, the technology, the size of the markup and the amount of capital per worker. And you can look more carefully at this and read about it in the book. So that was the price equation. Now we come to the long run or what economists call the natural level of production. By that we mean the, the normal level of production if we look through the business cycle. So we don't have a boom or a bust but the normal business cycle situation. What will production be? That's what we call the natural level of production. You can also think of it as an equilibrium level that you tend to return to when you are at a normal or neutral stage of the business cycle. So we have a labor force that we denote L and the labor force is measured as all the people who work or are not working but actively looking for work and those who are not working but actively looking for work are called unemployed. And normally in a market economy we have some unemployment and we will assume that there is some normal rate of unemployment that we call UN. Uh, so little u is for unemployment and n is for the natural rate of unemployment. So this means that it's, it's a normal rate of unemployment measured as a fraction of the labor force. And that means that there is a natural level of employment which is then 1 minus UN times the labor force. So for example if the normal or natural level of unemployment is 10% then the normal level of employment will be 90% of the labor force. And uh, we will later uh, study what determines the level of unemployment but now we take it as given and we substitute this into the production function and then we get the natural level of production as a function of the capital stock and then we have also added the technology factor E in the production function and now we see that the natural level or normal level of production uh, which we call YN is determined by four factors the amount of capital we have, the technology we have, the 
normal or natural rate of unemployment and the labor force. These four factors determine the long run or natural level of production and income in the economy. And this picture here illustrates the determination of the natural level of production. Finally, we come to the question of the distribution of income. And let us start with the real wage. So, as individuals, we don't really care what the wage is in euros or dollars. What we really care about is how much we can buy for the wage. The wage in terms of consumption. And that is what we call the real wage. And that is the wage divided by the price level. So, suppose for example that the wage is 100 and there is a consumption basket of goods that we buy and the unit of that basket of goods costs 20 then the, the real wage is 5. For a wage of 100 we can buy 5 units of the basket of goods. So that is what we mean by the real wage. So how is the real wage determined? Well, we already have a theory of that because we have the price equation. And if we just take that and we divide by P and multiply by marginal product, divide by the markup factor, we get an expression for the real wage. And the real wage is the marginal product divided by 1 plus the markup. Sometimes I call that the markup factor, 1 plus mu. So we see the higher the marginal product, the higher is the wage, and the higher the markup, the lower is the real wage. Uh, and the intuition, of course, is that if you have a high markup, then firms are making a profit. They are raising the prices to make higher profits, and that money has to come from somewhere, and it's going to reduce the real wage of the workers. So this determines the real wage. This uh, figure here illustrates the determination of employment and the real wage in this economy with imperfections in labor and product markets. So if we would have perfect competition in product and labor markets then everyone in the labor force would be employed and the workers would earn the marginal product at full employment. This means that the economy would be in this equilibrium where we have full employment and the workers earn the marginal product at full employment. But in this economy with imperfections we have instead employment below the full employment level. There is some unemployment the difference between L and NN is the unemployment. So employment is lower and also the firms are charging prices with a markup so the wage is not going to be the marginal product at this level of employment. The wage is going to be lower than the marginal product at this level of employment. So we see with imperfections we have lower employment and lower real wages than we would have with perfect competition in product and labor markets. So, to get further in understanding the determination of the distribution of income, we can use the Cobb-Douglas production function. And with that production function, there is a very simple relation between the marginal and average product of labor. It turns out that the marginal product of labor is just 1 minus alpha times the average product of labor. Average product of labor, that is production per uh, person working. And that you can prove by some simple math. You take the derivative and rewrite it a little bit. You can see that in the book. And we know that the real wage is the marginal product divided by 1 plus the markup. We then use now what we know about the marginal product. So we see the real wage is proportional to 
the average product of labor with the Cobb Douglas production function. And of course, everyone is not working in the economy, but if we assume that the fraction of the population that is working is constant, so you have a constant fraction that are retired and children, then employment will be proportional to the population, and we see that the real wage is going to be proportional to GDP per capita. So when we talk about GDP per capita in different economies, that is going to be closely related to the real wages that you get if you are a worker in that economy. Finally, we can rewrite this. If we just multiply by n and divide by y, we get the wage share. Because the wage times the number of workers, that's the total wage payments in the economy. And p times y, that is nominal GDP. So we see that the wage share is 1 minus alpha divided by 1 plus mu. So we know that, that alpha represents the importance of capital in the economy. So the more important capital is in the economy, the lower will the wage share be, because then capital owners will get a larger share of the income. And that is intuitive. And it has to do, alpha has to do with the technology. But we also see that the higher the markup the, f the firms charge, the higher are the prices and the lower is the wage share. Because the higher the markups, the higher are the profits that firms make and the lower share of income will go to workers. Now if you look at this from a policy point of view, well, the technology, that is pretty hard to influence with policy. There are not a lot of things that the politicians can do to influence the development and, of technology. But competition is something that depends very much on, on policy. And a key policy lesson here is that if you want the workers to get a large share of the income in the economy, you must promote competition. So we have now already derived a very important policy lesson. Unfortunately, it's a lesson that in many countries they have not learned. In, in, in many, especially in many developing countries, the politicians are not promoting competition, but actually protecting competition by making it hard to start businesses, hard to enter new markets, and so on. And often the existing businessmen, those who who are in the markets, of course they don't like competition, so they pay the politicians in order to protect their market from competition. And that way they can earn high profits and the workers get a, a low share of the total income in the economy. You see that all around the world. And often the argument is, well, we have to protect the jobs of the workers against unfair competition, whether it's from abroad or from uh, inside the country. But as macroeconomists, we want to have the big picture. We know that if you limit competition, you may protect those workers who happen to have jobs, but at the expense of everyone else. And in the end, you're actually hurting the workers. So we've learned something from this. And we have done a lot of hard work developing the building blocks of the supply side. So, in this chapter, we develop the key building blocks of the supply side. We learn about the production function. We derive the price equation. We understand what determines the long-run level of production and we find out how the real wage and the wage share of income are determined. So good luck with your studies of 
chapter 2.